We are live in Ottawa for what many are calling the unofficial launch of the 2019 election campaign. MPs are back in the House of Commons today, and each party returns armed with their pre-election strategy. The fall sitting, though, got off to a dramatic start when this happened just before question period. So after careful and deliberate consideration, I announced today that I am withdrawing from the government benches to take my seat among my Conservative colleagues under the strong leadership of Andrew Scheer. So why did Leona Alisev cross the floor and how does Andrew Scheer plan to dethrone the Liberals next year? Joining me now in studio is the leader of the official opposition, Andrew Scheer, and the newest Conservative MP, Leona Alisev. Hi, nice to see you nice both. How are you doing? Thank you very much for coming in. I've got to start out with uh, Ms. Alisev because you are the big newsmaker today. When did you decide to make this decision? Like, when did you decide to cross over? Well, I actually take my oath to the country very seriously. And so I'm always, every day, looking myself in the mirror and asking if I'm doing everything I can to serve my country. But in terms of making that final decision, I didn't make that final decision until I stood up in the House because I'm always considering whether or not this is how I can serve the best. So you didn't even know an hour before today that you were going to say what you did? I was obviously planning it, but that final decision doesn't happen until I was in the moment and I stood up. On July 20th, you tweeted your support for the government and that you were proud to be a part of the Liberal team heading into 2019. What happened between then and now that prompted you to make this significant of a decision? Well, in actual fact, that 20th of July tweet was really just to welcome the Prime Minister to our riding. There's no question that the Prime Minister is still the Prime Minister and he should be out in the country and we should always be proud to have as constituents, our Prime Minister you come to though, the You said, though, you were proud to be part of the team. You're obviously not proud to be part of that team today because to be you part of the country. Teams. To be part of the country and That's proud the of, my, of, of the Prime Minister because he's the Prime Minister of Canada. But I guess you can understand my confusion because you're saying you're proud of the Prime Minister. You today delivered a very big blow to, to him and to your former team. Uh, no, I chose to honour my oath to serve the country by doing what I think needs to be done, where we need to address some foundational challenges and I need to be part of a team that is committed to having the same priorities and addressing those foundational challenges, like tax reform, comprehensive uh, foreign policy, defense and security. Mr. Shear, when did Ms. Alislev approach you? Uh, you know, we had our initial conversation uh, a little while ago, a few weeks ago, and, and as she said, you know, nothing was guaranteed. She just, we wanted to have uh, uh, a conversation. She had some some very uh, deeply held concerns. Uh, she had some, some frustrations about uh, the current government, but also about what's going on in the world and how Canada uh, is responding to that. Uh, so we, we had some, some discussions about, uh, you know, what our party's view on certain things would be, everything from tax reform to how we deal with uh, change in the world workplace, how the workforce is being effective jobs for the next generation of Canadians. And uh, and as she said, you know, we, we kind of left it at that. We, we obviously, we, Just we a had few a, weeks lot, ago? We had a, a lot of points in commonality, but but nothing was promised, nothing nothing was guaranteed. We just knew that uh, I, I sent the indication that, as I do to everybody, who I hear from every day, who uh, see that where the government is going today, not being what they thought they were going to get in 2015, I said, well, there's a home for you in the Conservative Party. There's a home for you in the Conservative Caucus. We are tackling these issues. We have better ideas than, than the government. We, we want to take these things seriously. We don't take our role in traditional alliances for granted. Uh, we, we, we don't expect that just because everything's gone along well for the last 40 years, they'll go well for the next 40 years. We, we understand that there are very serious things at, at stake. And so if, if you do make the ultimate decision, just know that, that, that you'll be welcome. You, there's a place for you. You fit, you, will, you fit in with us. When was the deal sealed? Uh, 1.30... 132. So you didn't know before. <laughs> yeah, you didn't know before. No, I mean, look, I mean, obviously, like, real, right? obviously, you know, you, you you have conversations back and forth. Uh, Leona had some some questions. The 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 most important being, you know, how would this be received? She, you know, we 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 have a, a passionate people on our side, and there, you do have a bit of that bunker mentality in the House of Commons, where there's them and there's us, and and she wanted to make sure that 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 would be seen. That this was not seen in any way other than literally. As she said, she said so eloquently, you know, she's she's taken this oath to this country. She sees now that in order to fulfill that oath, 
the, the best way to fulfill that oath would be with the Conservative caucus. So, so obviously we, we, we had some, some uh, awareness that this was, uh, you know, something that she, she was likely to do, but and we, she made it very clear that, you know, this is a very serious decision and until it actually happened, uh, you know, there, nothing was guaranteed. Maxime Bernier says this proves what he's been saying all along, that the Liberals and the Conservatives are just the same. Does he have a point? No, I mean, not all. I mean, uh, uh, we have grown our party by staying true to our Conservative principles. We have not suddenly uh, become advocates for the carbon tax. We suddenly, we are not suddenly saying it's okay to run deficits. In, quite, in fact, quite the opposite. But he's saying you're we okay have... with supply management, you're okay with corporate welfare. Well, so is he when he, re well, he uh, sorry, not in corporate welfare. He, he, was, he was okay with that when it suited him, when it suited him to run under that banner, he was okay with that. He's okay with saying uh, certain things at certain times. We, the frustrating thing for me has always been that uh, uh, the points of commonality uh, between people who supported Maxime and the leadership and 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 are, where I am on many issues is we have so many points of commonality. And yet, for personal reasons, he's decided to put that across. What we see with Leona today is something that I've heard from coast to coast for the last year uh, and a bit, that many, many people who voted Liberal in 2015 are now realizing that they're not getting what they promised. And we have spent a great deal of time and energy not changing who we are, but projecting ourselves in a way that more and more Canadians can see themselves in our party. We have a positive message about how conservative principles can lift people out of poverty and create wealth and opportunity for everybody. And so in that, people are coming to us. And if the two parties really were the same, this is a very difficult decision. And How I difficult was it for you? It's a, it's a difficult decision to leave a party, particularly a party that's in government, and go to the opposition. So if the two parties were the same, then I might not have made the same decision. But I needed to go to a party that believed in defense and security and comprehensive foreign relations and tax reform and the things that matter because not all points in history are equal. Even though, even though I have to ask though, your, 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 your background is in defense. Uh, the, the Harper government had a big problem with, with uh, fulfilling its spending commitments on defense. Why do you think that the Conservatives would be any different this time around? Because I believe after speaking to the leader and to speaking with some of the people in his party as well, in our party, uh, that they recognize that not all points in history are equal and that we find our t ourselves in a time of global uh, Un instability that's unprecedented since basically the fall of the Berlin Wall. So, yes, we were able to cash in on the peace dividend. Yes, we were able to perhaps look at other priorities in the nation other than defense. But that is not the case today. We're seeing Russia. So you don't fault the Conservatives when they were when the when Prime Minister Harper was in charge for. Uh, not fulfilling its spending commitments on defense. It's about what they plan to do, what we believe is important today, and where we're going in the next election. And I, I do have to say, I mean, when you look at the record on procurement, uh, obviously uh, there are major challenges for any government, but when it comes to the shipbuilding strategy, when it comes to heavy lift, our Conservative government had a lot of successes. And here we have a Liberal government You could also on name round the CF-18s, three. you could also name we, spending look, overall as a percentage you, of GDP. You can have a, you, you, there, there's a debate to be had about uh, about which uh, aircraft is best for the country. We, we, we have our position, but nobody, Nobody voted for a government that would have us buy 40-year-old F-18s used. from us, used uh, f 18 That is not a, a, a renewal program for our Air Force. Nobody voted for that in the 2015 election. I want to ask you just about some things that happened in, in QP today in addition to, to this news, of course. You called, you know, you call the, the Liberals summer of failure, quote-unquote, um, and you specifically said their biggest failure was the TMX pipeline. What would you do in response to the court ruling? Mm -hmm. Well, the court ruling was very clear. It was that the process was okay, the process was fine. The government failed to execute it. They failed to live up to the standards that previous court decisions had placed on uh, the responsibilities that, that the previous court decisions had placed on the government to do. So would you start at the beginning those consultations? We, we, yeah. we are going to be announcing in a very short period of time practical solutions that this government could follow very quickly and proceed this. But we have to remember why what we find they? ourselves. I say, I, I know I'm not... Every time well, you hear you say a short, you know, know, short order, but... I, I, then we have. You know. um, I mean, but no. you've had as long as them, and you're telling them that they need to... No, 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 no. But, but we, we, have to, we have to go back and look at why 
all eyes are on TMX, why all eyes are on Trans Mountain. And it is because the Liberal government killed Northern Gateway. They killed Energy East. They, they imposed upstream and downstream emissions that no other sector in the economy Northern faces. Gateway faced a very similar court decision, though, based on your government's process. The, and the, They made the political decision not to proceed with that. That is That, that, was, a, that was their decision, and that effectively uh, it ended it. There, there, there will not be one under this government because they sent that signal. It's not that they had a problem they had to fix. They just decided for political reasons not After to proceed. After a court decision that was similar to the one that they just got. So, so, so tell me this. On this one, they say, well, okay, we're going to proceed. But on Northern Gateway, they said, no, we're not. So they made a political decision not to proceed. On Energy East, they imposed the upstream and downstream uh, emissions test. No other sector faces that. So we will continue seeing foreign oil being imported into eastern markets under this government. They've got Bill C-69, which is effectively a ban on pipelines that all experts in the energy sector agree will kill uh, new pipeline development. So yes, this is his summer of failure, and TMX Trans Mountain was a huge part of that. We bought would, the, he the, he, would you introduce legislation? We have called for this government to stand up for federal jurisdiction, to not allow uh, the, the NDP in British Columbia to, to, to infringe upon the federal ability to get projects in the national interest built. He hasn't done any of that. Let's think back to when... Uh, but he also but, keeps but, but, pointing out that your government couldn't get a pipeline built to Tidewater. To we, Tidewater. Listen, we, we got four major pipelines built that vastly increased Canada's ability to export our products. We had but Northern we, Gateway in the mix, and we had Energy East uh, as well, because those 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 projects that were proposed. Mm -hmm under our time in government, we're not, we're not at that point in the approvals process until this government took over and they've effectively killed them. That's the major difference. And he, he decided to send a check for $4.5 billion to Houston investors. They've cashed that check and they're gonna use it and build pipelines in the United States. Nobody believes that's an effective way to compete against the United States and to, to make sure that Canada's in a strong position against Donald Trump on these very important issues. All right, I'm out of time, but I really appreciate you both coming here. Thank Thanks to Andrew Shear and Leona Alsef. Appreciate it. I must withdraw from the government benches to take my seat among the ranks of my conservative colleagues. I wish her. Uh, well in her decision. I'm looking forward to getting back in the House to talk about uh, uh, what we're going to be doing for Canadians, what we've been working hard on all summer. For all those Canadians who supported Justin Trudeau in 2015 and are dissatisfied or even angry about the leadership that he's been giving, the Conservative Party needs you. Like the Trudeau's father, just watch me. <laughs> that's, the, that's the first time and the last time that I will quote him. The fall sitting got off to a dramatic start with Liberal backbencher Leona Alislev crossing the floor to join the Conservatives. The opposition also welcomed a new MP to the House of Commons, Richard Martel, who won a by-election this summer in Quebec. Meanwhile, Maxime Bernier is now sitting as the sole member of the newly formed People's Party of Canada. Is day one just a precursor of the weeks ahead? And where do the parties stand on the scoreboard? It's time for the power panel. In Toronto, Brad Levine of Council Public Affairs. Yolande James, former Quebec Liberal Cabinet Minister, joins us from Montreal. And here with me in studio, former Director of Policy to Stephen Harper, Rachel Kern of Harper & Associates, and Le Devoir's Marie Vestel. Hi, everyone. Hi. Nice Hi. to see Hello. you on this super slow first day back. <laughs> um, Yolande, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Uh, how, how big of a blow to the Liberals' morale is today's floor crossing? Well, seeing a, a caucus member cross the floor and by surprise is not is not good news, no matter how you cut it. And for Andrew Scheer, I mean, you have to give him political points for being able to win the day and essentially being able to say, hey, everyone's been talking about Maxime Bernier all weekend, but I'm starting off the session A by surprising you and adding a member to the team. And for the Liberals, as much as they have to look ahead to the session and might still be living, uh, I mean, still be leading in the polls, you got to ask questions in terms of, okay, so we have one caucus member that's, that's, that's made the decision to leave. And when I listened to her today, as to the reasons why there were a number of things. It was never one particular issue. So they have to ask themselves the questions with the others. Managing a big caucus like that with over 180 people um, is not an easy thing to do, but you've got to make sure in challenging times for the government that uh, that people in caucus are satisfied. So they they won't admit it, obviously, but obviously it's not something that you want to be able to see, as conservatives can say, having been on the other side of that with Ev Avenoms, for example. So, um, I mean, it's one day. I don't think it, 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 it 
foreshadows what's going to happen in the future. As you all know, things change really quickly. But uh, Andrew Scheer was able to have the upper hand today by catching everybody by surprise and, and showing that, hey, if you guys thought that I didn't, I was just losing people or losing a, 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 a colleague in Maxime Bernier, I'm still able to bring people to the team, as well as, don't forget, mel uh, welcoming a new m and MP, reminding people that he, uh, that he won the by-election in Quebec a few months ago. Rachel, um, when Maxime Bernier left the party, you were pretty unequivocal that you thought it would be uh, a big mm -hmm. blow to the Conservatives and that it was handing victory yeah. to the Liberals. Does this do enough to swing the pendulum the other way? Well, I, I, no, in simple math terms, it doesn't. And I still think it's a problem if Maxime Bernier is going to be out there forming his own party and trying to pull support from Andrew Scheer. Um, and even if he can't pull support to sort of suppress the conservative vote, vote a little. So I think that, still think that's a real risk. That said, I agree with Yolande. I mean, this is a great announcement for Andrew Scheer to have on his first day back. Uh, it really put some wind into his sails. And I think what's particularly effective about it is that it fits with the narrative that he wants to present to Canadians in the last year leading up to an election. I can't believe we're in the last year before an election already. So exciting. There's our uh, countdown right there, 398 days. It's incredible. It seems like we were just, you know, going through this whole exercise. But this fits with the story he wants to tell, that Justin Trudeau promised all of these things in 2015, whether it was support for the middle class or, you know, increasing Canada his presence on the international stage or support for the military, whatever it was, he hasn't been able to deliver on any of those promises. And so Andrew Scheer is presenting himself uh, as the alternative to, to Justin Trudeau in terms of good, competent government uh, that Canadians can rely on. So this fits this, this kind of story that um, Ms. Alisev is telling uh, about why she has crossed the floor. And I should say it's very unusual to cross the floor to the opposition uh, when you're in government. So the fact that she has uh, done so and, and sort of in the, in the process of doing so has said, all of Justin Trudeau's record uh, doesn't sit well with me. This is not what I signed up for. That's exactly the kind of message that Andrew Scheer wants to send to Canadians more broadly leading into an election. Brad, do you think that's the message that Canadians will draw from this floor crossing? And I ask because Yolande also brought up an interesting point that, and we had Ms. Elislav on the show, she articulated sort of a broad dissatisfaction mm -hmm. and, and inability to voice her concerns, but she didn't say, you know, he's done X, Y, and Z very specifically wrong, and that is what compelled me to leave. Well, yeah, that's right. And just just in July 17th, uh, she welcomed uh, Justin Trudeau to her riding, uh, to a region, where she had this big rally and said, what a great job the Trudeau government is doing, and we welcome Mr. Trudeau to, uh, uh, to, to my neck of the woods. That was only uh, 60 days ago. Uh, there was no one thing that precipitated it. But I, I just want to pick up on a point about how, how fundamentally undemocratic floor crossing is. doesn't matter who does it, whether you're going from government to opposition or the other way. Fundamentally, people did not vote for uh, the conservative candidate in that riding, and when floor crossers uh, do so, they're doing so, and you have to ask yourselves, why are they doing so? Usually there'd be one trigger, maybe there was an initiative that, would, that went against, uh, you know, what, what they ran on uh, in the last election campaign, or there's something that, that kind of sparks, but floor crossing uh, fundamentally being undemocratic. We have to ask: Is it not? Is it not just pure opportunism uh, by this by this by this member of parliament? Now she just squeaked in in the 2015 election as a liberal. Uh, the the conservatives here in Ontario provincially won that seat with 56 percent of the vote. She's probably looking ahead, saying, "You know what? I'm not going to win as a liberal, but I'd likely win and win the nomination." I'm sure uh, Mr. Shear uh, said that I'm, you know might be clear sailing or better sailing for you as a conservative. So we have to ask ourselves: Is this not just rank opportunism? And how fundamentally undemocratic it is for people of that riding to have their MP just on their own accord uh, across the floor because people did not elect a conservative in. That that, uh, in that riding, even though we could probably make the case that there's not much difference uh, in that neck of the woods between the red and the blue team. <laughs> I think that's the point that Maxime Bernier was making. I'll just, yeah. I'll just say on that, though, one point we'd had Eric Grenier on a couple times over the past few hours, and he made the point, and I understand the outrage, but that I, I can't remember if it's two thirds or three quarters, but that many people, when they, they do cross the floor, they actually end up winning. Right, but but but, 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 yeah. but 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 allow me to, to that reinforces so, my point that people are doing so out of self interest. That is, yeah. I want to get reelected, but I can't do so on the team that I got elected last time. But so voters don't ship. seem to be as cynical about that as you. 
apparently. Uh, well, I, I think that By there's democratic measures. principles. And listen, this is the trifecta, right? You've got floor crossing, undemocratic, the elected Senate, and uh, first past the post. These are the, the, the trifecta of our undemocratic system. Yeah, I, think, <laughs> I think it depends on the election. And I think it, also don't forget the members have their say, right? Eve Adams um, did not win the nomination when no. he crossed the floor to Absolutely. the liberals. And so we'll see what happens in this instance. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Costa Sminigakis, mm -hmm. the ex-MP, who had won the nomination for her writing, has now um, stepped aside to let her no run. We'll see if some, yeah, we'll see if someone else runs. But I think, I think this is definitely good news for Andrew Shearer. It was a great day having you know a new ex-liberal MP and having a new elected MP. Um, the thing that uh, the Liberals could uh, at least console themselves with is that she's not you know the most well-known conservative. No. I'm not sure many people knew who she was until 150 today, um, and so that that makes it a, a little less bad um, if it can. The other thing I would agree with Brad on is the fact that she listed so many reasons and it was so vague that it does seem to indicate that there was no particular instance where, you know, she voiced her concern about one particular initiative and, and, and something went wrong. Because there are MPs, actually, in the Liberal government who have disagreed um, with Justin Trudeau. You can think of Nathaniel Erskine-Smith mm -hmm. on electoral reform, some MPs in BC about Trans Mountain, some MPs in Quebec told my paper Le Devoir that they really wanted a um, Quebec uh, judge to be named the head judge, I forget how you say that in English, at the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And so some people have been allowed to disagree. The fact that she couldn't really indicate what went wrong kind of suggests to me that it is also perhaps because she saw that her provincial writing um, went conservative and she kind of wanted to save her, save her seat for next time. Although, Yolande, uh, in her first question and question period and in our interview with her, she did bring up procurement and defense as... Uh, and pointed to certain, you know, perceived failings on her part of the government on that, and that might give us an indication um, if you're looking outside of political fortunes. Sure, that 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 might give an indication. I just think that it's important for the Liberals today, at least internally, to not just say, okay, this it, this happens, and it does happen. It doesn't mean that, it, as I mentioned, that it changes uh, necessarily what's uh, upcoming in 2019 in terms of their ability to win, win the election. But when something like this happens, I do think that you have a duty to look inside, especially with respect to caucus morale, especially since she didn't name anything. So are, are there other people, and conservatives should ask themselves the same questions, too, and when you look at what's happening with the NDP, are there other, other people that could be upset about things and what could be done to make sure that everybody um, has a voice and is able to do that? But if it's by pure opportunism, there was nothing that could be done, well, then, hey, good riddance, and we'll see what um, her riding decides in 2019. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think this is undemocratic, uh, to be honest. I don't think voters are that tribal. I don't think they necessarily think as much about what party is representing them, but they think more about positions on particular issues and whether their MP is representing their views. And clearly, uh, Leona Elisa felt that she couldn't represent the views of her constituency, at least not fully and fairly, sitting as a member of the Trudeau government. Although I, I remember see, when I Brett Rathgaber left and the party, yeah. and the, at the time, yeah. the, the government was saying, no, he needs to run in a by-election. Well, look, there's a, you know, you're never happy with it when a member of your caucus leaves. Um, but, but honestly, I think voters will get a chance to um, have their say on whether they agree with her move uh, in a year from now. So it's not as though she is sort of run on a, a particular platform and then immediately crossed the floor. She's had sort of three years as part of the government and in senior roles, too. So she's been a parliamentary secretary in this government. Uh, and I know Maria is saying, well, not many people have heard of heard of her, but she has had very senior roles within this well, government. Not, you know. So she has had a chance to sort of um, interact with her colleagues, uh, to look at the agenda, to figure out what the Trudeau had, government has been doing for the past three years. And she said, this isn't working for me. So I don't think there's anything undemocratic about that. I think she's saying, this is where I'd like to be going forward. Here's how I'd like to position myself for the next election. Uh, and we'll see what voters have to say. Brad, is right. that is there a point there and that, you know, voters will be heard on Election Day in about a year? A, lo a lot of, you know, I, I, I. It's, it's, if the M it's all about the, M the MP and not the, not the constituents. But let, let, let's, I mean, this extends Trudeau's bad summer uh, well and, you know, into the fall. Uh, th today was timed for maximum damage. The first day back of the House of Commons for, the, for, for this uh, sitting, 
Uh, the only topic we're talking, we're not talking about any initiatives uh, to help the middle class or anything that uh, Trudeau wants to uh, wants to spin. We're talking about uh, Trudeau losing uh, a member of his caucus, and 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 to Rachel's point, somebody who's had parliamentary secretary uh, jobs in the past. Uh, you know, add to all the bad news that he's had over the last number of weeks, number of months, uh, and it's got to put them off the the footing. It's put winds in in Shear's sail for sure. Uh, and, and, you know, where's Bernier? Uh, where, where's the where, NDP? Where's Bernier going to get, yes. uh, you know, I think, I think that Scheer uh, has done a nice job of putting him not, not necessarily as front and center as he was over the last 72 hours. Um, well, let or, me, let or me. it proves his point, which is what he was saying, right? That it, the same old, it's the same thing, liberals or conservatives, if you can just pass from one to the next. I would argue it's great for Andrew Scheer. I, I completely agree with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, I would also remind Andrew Scheer not to forget the right flank because, as we said mm -hmm. last week, I think that Maxime Bernier could you know, um, seem interesting to some people who want a different um, political discourse in Canada.